And so for us, we can implement that into our lives. We can put that to work immediately as an action step in our lives. So we do tithes and offerings every week. We do not pass the plate because of COVID restrictions. But if you'd like to make an offering, there's a plate at the front and in the back. And you can do that either before or after the service. And we are very thankful for that. And we'll pray over those in just a minute. But we also do um, our prayer requests, our prayer uh, concerns. Are there any at this time? I know Patsy had one. I, I just want, would like to ask for prayers for the family of jo Joelle Morado. Um, she is one of my renters, but as she was a renter, she also became uh, a good friend. She's around 33 years old. Uh, she's been fighting cancer for a year and a half, two years. She lost her fight yesterday morning, so uh, please be in prayer for her family. Joelle Morado, right? Okay. She was 33. She passed away from cancer yesterday. Anybody else? Remember my family, about half of them. I'm not laughing, Marty. I'm just smiling. You know that because. Oh my goodness. Marty got a call from some of her family in Louisiana, and it was her cousins, and they they all have COVID. Their their spouses have COVID, and their kids have COVID. Uh, so remember them. In addition to Tina and Shonda, both having COVID. Are they any better, Marty? Uh, they said they were taking baby steps today, and Tina said, "I believe and trust in God." Isn't it great that Margie's back with us this morning? Amen. 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 Anybody else? Please remember uh, the Yates family, those fam the friends of Jill's whose uh, uh, Roxanne's father passed away on Friday. And then um, my cousin Mary Cobb, her, her dad passed away on Friday as well. So remember them. Any others? Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we are humble before you because we acknowledge you, the one with the power. You're the creator. You are Abba Father. You are the one that uh, has breathed life into us and you give us purpose and meaning. And Lord, we come to you because you tell us to pray without ceasing. You tell us to come together as the body of Christ and that where two or more are gathered, there you are also in Matthew 18. And Lord, we come because we're giving you praise. For the different things that we've seen go on in this church and in our personal lives this week, um, we honor you um, by being here this morning. We honor you by um, lifting our voices in song and prayer. And Lord, we bring to you our prayer requests. We bring to you the things that lay heavy on our hearts, our family and friends. And we've got at least four families that we know of who are grieving today for the loss of a loved one. And we ask that your Holy Spirit attend to them, be the comforter and counselor and advocate that you are. And Lord, we ask that you would lift them up in the midst of this and give them hope. And Lord, we ask your blessing on our tithes and offerings today. We ask that you'd multiply them, that you would use them uh, not only for this church, but for this community and for the building up of your kingdom. That you would get it to the folks that are hungry and in need. And Lord, that you would use it to reach the lost and with the message of Jesus Christ. Bless this service, Lord, and I ask that uh, you would your word would be proclaimed here today, that you would open the Bible to us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, Margie's going to come up and sing for us. Make sure to turn that mic on, Margie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got to slide that thing. I just want to say how thankful I am to be back at the church. I, I was talking to my girls this morning before I left, and I... I said, you're not going to church this morning? I said, uh, I've got to have some food for my soul. I talked to Patsy about it. I, there's days, that every day you got to have food for your soul. But I don't know, being around other Christians that believe the same thing you do, and, and you know they're praying for you, and uh, it just makes you feel, I, I, I feel warm and at home. And I want to thank everybody, uh, especially the pastor and his family, for all the food. <laughs> Uh, I told uh, my son, I said, you cannot imagine the food that has come over here. And so uh, he tries to make it by on the days he thinks there may be <laughs> something there. But I, I really thank all of you for it. I thank you most for your prayers. But uh, the food has meant a lot to me and my husband. I just want to thank you for it. I asked Patsy what I should sing. Because <laughs> I, I really wasn't going to sing this morning. And... Uh, 
but she uh, she suggests that I sing this song here because it's certainly been true. I have journeyed through the long dark night out in the open sea by faith
say and what our teachers say and all of those wonderful things and so I have to tell you this story a friend of mine when we were ninth graders uh, maybe going into the 10th grade he decided because his parents had gone out of town that he was going to invite his girlfriend over to the house and so one thing that his mom and dad had always said to him is you don't play with matches or lighters or any of that kind of stuff and you definitely don't use the grill that's out on the back porch and he decided he wanted to have this girl over, and he was going to cook her some dinner. He said, the only thing I can really cook is like a hamburger or a steak. And he said, to do that, I'm going to need to use the grill. I've watched my dad a bunch of times, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. So he goes, and he takes a shower, and he puts some stuff in his hair, and he starts combing it really nice and looking in the mirror, put on some good cologne and the good deodorant, you know, and dressed up very nice. And he went and bought some really good steaks and all of this. And he's going to wow her. And he said, while I'm here, I'm going to get her some of these beautiful flowers. So he gets that and he has those out on the table. And he's got this the, the good china out on the table. He's not supposed to do any of this. His parents said, don't have anybody over. You're not supposed to have anybody at our house when we're not here. He said, what they don't know won't hurt. And so he gets all this out. And it's a beautiful table. It's absolutely gorgeous. And he's going so excited i've got my nicest clothes on i smell good i'm gonna cook a good meal and we're gonna have a great time it'll be so romantic and she'll just fall in love with me so she comes over to the house and he's like you look beautiful come in and sit down i'm gonna cook you a meal you know and so he goes out on the deck and he's looking around at the grill and he said now let's see what does dad do here he turns on this thing down at the bottom which has got the gas in it so i'll turn that on and then uh he pushes a button to get it to light. Let's see where that button is. And, uh, oh, that button's not working. Let me go get a lighter inside. So he goes back inside and gets a lighter or some matches. And he comes back out. And he said, now, where do, when I light this, where do I put it? And it took him a couple of minutes to try to figure out where to put it. And so he does this right here. And he said, he just raised the top on it like this and went, like that. And it exploded up into his face and it burned off all the hair right here on the front of his hair. All of his eyebrows, it burned all that. And it torched his face so that his face was bright red and singed his clothes where they were kind of smoking. And he had to walk back inside to this girl and go, we need to call somebody because I'm hurt. <laughs> and then they had to call his parents and they had to come home from where they were and take him to the doctor. And they were the whole time they were worried about him, but they were saying, didn't we tell you, you don't have anybody to the house. Don't play with matches. Don't use the grill. And what do you think the girl thought about him at that point? He's crazy. Yes, exactly. He was crazy. That's exactly right. So it's important for us is, is, is if our teachers are telling us something, if our coaches are telling us something, if our parents are telling us something, there's a good reason for it. And so we need to listen to what they say and put it into action. And it, it'll protect us. It'll help us. And the same is true. God does the same thing through Sunday school teachers and children's church teachers and through preachers and through the Bible. And so when he says, you should do this, we should probably do it. When he says, don't do this, we probably shouldn't do it. It's in our best interest. It'll help us if we do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to have these beautiful children here today. And they're so sweet and they're always well behaved. And, and I thank you for their families. And, and Lord, I ask your blessing upon them and upon our 
church. And Lord, we ask that you would grow this group and that we would just have more and more children because uh, the next generation needs to know and love Jesus the way this generation does. Lord, thank you so much for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You did great today. Awesome job. The scripture today is from Luke chapter 10. And it's the story of Mary and Martha. It's verse 38. And this particular passage, we're going to talk today about growing our faith. We're, we're in, you know, we've been talking for the last two weeks about I got saved. I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I know where I'm going when I die, but what do I do at this point here? And um, hey, Sila, there is, just so you know, there, there's a room down here too that y'all can use. It's the second door, just past that little library. There's, and it has some toys and stuff in it as well, so just be aware of that. They're doing children's church stuff, so. Okay, so in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, where you hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me! Exclamation mark. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, for us, when we sit here and we start looking at these particular passages, um, we're trying to figure out, how does that apply to me? How is that something that's going to help me in my daily walk with Christ? And you have to kind of figure out, are you more Mary or are you more Martha? And actually, for us, Jesus is calling us to be Mary in this situation because Mary is sitting in the, at his feet and she is looking at him and she is listening. And those are going to be our action steps for today is that we have to get to the point where we are looking, listening, and learning. That's the title of the sermon. So I just shared with you that the, the story of my friend Jeff and about not listening to his parents, not, not taking what their advice was and, and disobeying and what the, the situation got him into. My, one of my very best friends, Eloise, and y'all have to get why, why this is the case, why this is such a, a good example, is the husband had a car, Mike. He had a car that he was going to redo and had never gotten around to. It was in the garage. It was, a, it was an old, beat-up car, but he was planning to do great things with it. He'd been working on the engine, hadn't done a whole lot to the outside of it. He was working on the transmission some, trying to get everything ready, and then he would eventually paint it. And he, he just loved that car and thought it was just the greatest thing. And he said, I've just never really gotten around to getting it done. I hope to get it done one day. So he went to work one day, and his wife, she said, you know... I'm going to do something nice for my husband. She went out in the garage and she started opening up paint cans that were out in the garage, seeing what kind of paint she had out in the garage, whatever was left over on the shelves. And so she's looking around and she opens this one and there's some blue and here's some green and over here's some white and some taupe and, and there, ooh, there's some purple. That purple is absolutely beautiful. So she takes a big house brush, one that you, you know, you do some trim work with at your house and it's about that wide. And she didn't look what kind of paint it was or anything. It was just pretty purple paint. So she dipped it in that bucket of paint. She had a gallon of it. So I painted his car for him. So she painted that entire car purple with house paint, exterior house paint. And uh, all, the, all the top and everything, everything front, the, the, the grill, you know, the everything, she painted purple. And he came home and he's like, you know, and she's, she's, she's beating. She really is beating. And she says, I got to show you something. And so he goes out, opens the garage door. There's his car, purple with house paint, painted with a brush. And he said, at that point, because I talked to him about it, and I said, what, what did you say in that moment? What did you do in that moment? And he's like, I love my wife. And he said, I, wanted my, I know that my face was bright red. I wanted to erupt like a volcano. I wanted to go, it's house paint. You painted my car with house paint and a brush. 
we take it somewhere and get them to paint it or we use a sprayer in our, if we had those abilities here at the house. But he said, I didn't say any of that. I just said, thank you. And then I sat down at the dinner table and I explained to her how we would still need to get it painted someday because you can't have house paint on it the way that it is because it wouldn't last long. He said, I explained it to her. And he said, I could see her tears welling up in her eyes. And the, the sadness that that brought to her, the frustration that that brought to their marriage is something we want to avoid. But I think in my life, on a daily basis, I experience that with kids and marriage and work and wherever I go, all those different situations. And so for us, we're trying to learn what God has for us, and that requires us to look and to listen. It requires both of those things. So here we have the idea of look. And for us, I'm going to teach you about communication, especially men. Men are the worst communicators on the planet in terms of being in a marriage. I hate to say it. Um, but we just, we just don't do a, a good job about it, is that Jill will sit and talk to me. Now, she's down here. She's already kicking her leg down here. She's giving me that. If she had chewing gum in her mouth, she'd be like, you know, giving me that, that look of don't share too much here. Okay, so if I'm watching TV, if I come in from a long day, we've had dinner together, and then we're sitting down in the living room, and I sit down, and I'm looking that direction at the TV, sometimes she'll start talking to me. And sometimes it's important stuff. Sometimes she'll say, I need for you to pick up Sela at uh, 2 o'clock tomorrow to take her to the dentist or whatever. And I'm sitting there and I'm just looking at that TV and I'm watching the show. And then I'll get up and I'll go do something else. And she'll mention that later on. She'll say, you know, she goes, you know, she's got to have a cleaning or whatever. I go, what are you talking about? And she'll go, were you not listening to me just a minute ago when I was talking to you in the living room? And I'll say, what did you say to me in the living room? And she said, about going to the dentist tomorrow. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And she goes, you were looking at the TV the whole time rather than listening to me. And I said, this is, a pr this is a thing that we can learn from is that we need to make eye contact with people, especially if you do things like sell for a living. If you walk into somebody's office and you go, I'm selling turtle wax, Eloise, and uh, would you like to, it's, a few, it's just, it'll help. It, it, it's a good, you know, would you like to maybe buy some from me? It's never going to work never going to work because we need to look people in the eye to communicate and make sure to acknowledge them as a human being, number one, acknowledge their importance in this conversation that we're having. But we need to be looking at them because that helps us to be able to focus and to listen to what they have to say. So the looking starts first. And sometimes it just takes the looking for us to get the message. Is that not right? How many of y'all grew up in the church? Raise your hand. It's not a tour. Okay. When in the church that I grew up in, that choir loft would be full of people, men and women. And our pastor always asked the children and the youth to sit on the first three rows on each side. And we would all sit together down there, and there was a whole lot of this going on. You know what I'm saying? A whole lot of you know, giggling and, and poking and, and writing notes and, and all that kind of stuff. And if I was involved in any of that, and you, you tell them if I'm lying, Martha or, or Myrtle or any of you on Martha, my mom would look at me from the choir loft. She wouldn't get up. She would just go. And I knew that if I did not stop whatever it was I was doing right then, that she or my dad was going to come and take me out back behind the church, right? That they were going to make me get up in front of all my friends by the ear probably and go out. So that look is sometimes so important, um, just making that eye contact. Well, can you imagine making eye contact with Jesus? Can you imagine that? Is that in that moment, everything stops and my sole attention is on you. Eloise was a principal. Linda Lester was a principal. How many times when somebody, some kid came to your office, would they not look you in the face? Right? Because they're ashamed a lot of times. Right? There is that. But for us as adults, looking at each other acknowledges, hey, you have meaning. You have purpose. You're important to me. Well, that's what Jesus is doing here is not only is Mary looking at him, but he's looking at her and he's saying, here's some stuff that would help you. Here's some stuff that might impact your life and help make some changes that will benefit you and eliminate some of this frustration, this anger, this sadness, whatever the depression that it might be that's in your life. Now, the part about looking to me reminds me a lot of how God has us learning in the Bible. So you have somebody like Moses. And who was his right-hand man? Well, you had Aaron that was his brother who was a priest. 
But the guy that kind of followed Moses around watching him, looking at him, was Joshua. And Joshua was learning. He was watching. He was younger. He was trying to figure out what it means to lead the people of Israel. And so he was kind of being discipled on the job. And so he would watch what Moses would do. And, of course, God was, was telling Moses exactly what to do. Joshua watched that. He learned. And when Moses passed, what did Joshua do? He led the people of Israel. And, in fact, you, you do know that, that Moses held up his staff and the Red Sea parted. Do you know that that same thing happened with Joshua when they went to the Promised Land? Is that the Jordan River parted and they walked across on dry land, the Jordan River, at flood stage. So I want you to see that at some point, Joshua's faith had to have been grown to the point where he believed that God could do the impossible and do whatever that he said that he was going to do. And by doing that, he watched Moses. He watched how he reacted. And when something happened, how he gave thanks, how he gave the credit to God. And so he was being discipled. You find the same thing with Elijah and Elisha. You have Elijah the great prophet and Elisha following him around as his attendant. And when Elijah was taken up in the chariot of fire, what did Elisha do? In first and second Kings, it's in second Kings. Is that he started to be the prophet that Elijah was. And then all these miracles, signs, and wonders, and the power of God flowing through him. So there's this discipleship ministry that we see in the Old Testament. And then what did Jesus do when he came down here? Did he need 12 disciples? Shake your head yes or no. Did he need him? No, he's the son of God, right? He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's discipling those 12 men to go out, and that's what they did. On all except Judas, right? Uh, who was replaced by Matthias. And so here you have these 12 men being trained and discipled so that then they can go and do the ministry that Jesus was doing. And instead of it being one man, then it is 12 men, and they were called to go disciple. You see how the, multipl the multiplication works in terms of growing the church and getting the word out as fast as possible. They were watching and looking at Jesus. Now, Harlan and I like to shoot guns. I am a Second Amendment person I love. I don't own any guns, but I love to shoot them. My friend Randy takes me out all the time. We go hunting. And, uh, but Harlan, what if you said to somebody, you're trying to teach Allie how to shoot a gun and a rifle, and you said, just point it over there somewhere and try to hit the target. What do you have to do when you're shooting the rifle? You use your eye to look on the sight and you sight in the gun so that you can hit the target. But you, you can't close your eyes and shoot a gun and expect to hit the target. You can't just hold it at waist high like they do in the movies and expect to hit something. Am I, am I right about that, Arnold? You actually have to aim that gun using your eyesight. And so we have to learn that in our Christian walk to be able to aim at the right things and the stuff that we tend to look at it's not stuff that helps us. You know what I'm saying? It's not. Most of the time, the things that we focus on and the people that we watch and emulate are folks that are leading us down a path that is just never going to help us. It's never going to benefit us. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, let's move to the second one. From look, we go to listen. And all of these are elements of communication. So, Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. She's looking at his face, which I'm sure she can see love and compassion in any way. But then she's listening to what they have to say. Listening requires, if, if we flip over, everybody, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to, you've heard this in about 100 sermons, I'm sure. But James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, if you're following along on your phone or on the Pew Bible there or your Bible that you brought with you. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. So get your pen and paper out. It's what it just told you to, right? This is James. This is Jesus' brother telling you something that's important enough. He wants you to mark it down. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. It's telling us to be quick to listen. If I can guarantee you, if, uh, you know, some of you all might not be willing to listen to what I have to say. You might be distracted by whatever. You might be looking at your phone. You might be doing whatever. But if somebody that you wanted to hear was up here, 
let's say Mike from American Pickers, Mike, you know what I'm talking about, Mike or Frank, one of those guys that is invested in this community, if they were to come and to get up here and speak, people would lean in and go, man, these guys are, these are TV stars and they've got a lot of money and they're investing in it. And one of them does a lot of stuff with, with cars and one of them does a lot of stuff with bicycles and I want to hear that and we lean in and we listen. We're quick to listen. Well, we have to be, for us, a lot of times, if there's a fight at a school, two kids are standing there, one's done something to offend the other one, there's a crowd that usually forms right around them. And what is that crowd usually yelling? Fight. Fight. Come on. Hit it. Fight. Hit it. Touch it. Hit it. And that's what the crowd's saying. And so if we're quick to listen in that situation, who are we listening to? Oh my goodness. We have to, we have to be aware of who we're listening to. And sometimes, you know, uh, our relatives can say things to us that aren't helpful. Sometimes our bosses say things to us that aren't helpful. Um, coaches, all of that. And we have to learn to listen to the one that has our best interest at heart. That's not your mama. Even though your mama loves you here on earth more than anybody. I know that mom and dad. So, but who should we be listening to? Jesus. And how do we do that? Okay, some preachers will get up here and say, then you need to listen to me. And I'll tell you what God says. No. No. I'm just a man just like you. God says in, uh, also in 1 Peter that, that we're a royal priesthood of believers, all of us together. And so for us, we need to be praying and listening. Did, did you hear me? Because for me, again, I'm the type of person that has a to-do list. I also have a prayer list, Eloise. And so if I start praying, I start going, Lord, be with Margie and be with Ron and be with Tina and be with Shonda and then and, and I go through my family and I'm sitting there and I, I'm listing it out like my Christmas list. I'm going, Lord, do this and Lord, do this and Lord, do this and Lord, do this and Lord, do this. I'm done. In Jesus' name, amen. At some point in our prayer lives, we have to close our mouth and listen for him. And he'll speak to us in a bunch of different ways. He'll speak to us through the Bible, his word. In the Bible, how does God speak to his people? Claudia pointed out that, that how did Balaam get talked to? How did God express himself to him through a donkey? A talking animal spoke and said, you kind of reprimanded him. How else does God speak to us? Speaks to us through nature. You know, Romans chapter 1 says that you can look around you and know that there's a God and that he speaks to us just by looking at what he's created that's all around us. So, but for the most part, he, he speaks to us in a bunch of different ways, whether it's a still, small voice within us, other Christians around us. Let me be clear about that. If a Christian comes to you and says, God told me to tell you to give me all your money, that's not, you know, that's not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about physically that, that somebody who loves you and cares about you. And, and if they're coming to you and they say, let me tell you your 14 sins, you may not want to listen to that either. You know what I'm saying? If you have, somebody comes humbly to you and says, hey, God told me to tell you this, then you, you need to listen to that. But God speaks to us mostly through his word. When I read his word, it can you imagine that this is written in so many different locations by so many different people and so many thousands of years ago, and it still speaks to us today? In the, in as much as it's changed, I told you that I did my grandfather's funeral and he was born before the tractor was invented, before planes existed. You know, there were some automobiles to some degree, but... And how the world changed just in his lifetime to have the internet and cell phones and all that we have today. So the Bible to be as old and as buried as it is in terms of who wrote it and where they wrote it still is speaks to us right where we are today. So we need to be listening to God and listening for what he has to say to us, not only um, out loud, but through the still small voice, through the Bible, and when he speaks to us. Now, Sometimes, uh, if, what would prevent us from listening? Somebody, somebody give, me, give me something. What would keep you from listening to somebody or something? Distractions. How about distractions? Like a TV or something like that, right? Okay, how about, have you ever tried to talk to somebody who's had like two cups of coffee, three cups of coffee? I mean, have you ever sat down and just tried to have a conversation with them and they're going... I mean, the caffeine within them is going, and they have to get up to go use the restroom because co coffee's a diuretic. And so they're just constantly kind of. Jill's, Jill's got a whole class of first graders. And I said, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine. Eloise taught first grade, didn't you, Eloise? I mean, I can't imagine walking 
in. And because you know that they have, when they got up in the morning, five minutes before they were supposed to leave the house, that they ate a bowl of chocolate-covered sugar bombs uh, as fast as they could eat it, down some orange juice, grabbed a Pop-Tart, ran out the door, and then they go to first period. And they're sitting there, and the sugar and the caffeine are kicking in, and they're saying, can you listen to what I have to say about how to do arithmetic? Can you, I'm on, we're going to do some science now. Let, let me show you some of these principles, and, and right? And for them to be able to listen, and it's the same for us. It's exactly the same. If you came, if Myrtle came, called me on Thanksgiving Day about 3 o'clock, and she said, I really need to talk to you, Chris. Can I come over? I'd go, yeah, yeah you can come over, Myrtle. Go ahead. Go ahead and come over. And if she came to my house and she sat down, I would be so sleepy and tired, I'd be so full and miserable of food that it would be hard for me to listen to what she had to say. So understand that there's a time and a place for listening in terms of sometimes Jill will come, she goes, can we talk about this? And I go, can we make an appointment in an hour? Give me an hour to decompress. Give me an hour to get what I'm doing right now done and then I can just solely focus on you. Sometimes that's what we need to do in terms of making sure that our listening is exactly right. So, um, you know, uh, the next step for us besides looking and listening then would be learning. And that means putting it into practice. And I want you to hear this because we, we were talking about shooting just a minute ago. The military doesn't just take people and you, you, they go, we need some people to be in the military. You throw up your hand and then they send you to a battle. They don't do that. Now, in World War II, it was almost that way because they needed people so quickly. But they train them, right, Harlan? I mean, they take them and they teach them something and they practice it and then they go do it. And that's true for us is that we need to practice some of these things. Like on Wednesday night, I'll say, is there anybody that wants to pray? Well, praying in front of 10 or 15 people is a whole lot easier than praying in front of 200 or 1,000. It's a whole lot easier for us to, to teach a lesson to children when there's two of them as opposed to a room full of middle schoolers. Right, Eloise? Anybody here ever taught junior high, Sunday school, or a Bible study? Oh, my goodness. You, they ask questions that, that uh, you know, some of the greatest theologians of all time would have trouble on the spot answering. And so for us, we've got to be able to practice certain things so that we can get efficient at them so that we can produce fruit. Um, so many times, it, do you think that's important? Practicing and learning, listening, looking, all those things? Okay, let, let's just talk about it for a second. We have great faith in certain things. You know who you have great faith in? The people on the assembly line who built your car. Do you want them to be trained? Do you want them to have practiced their job and have learned how to do it? No. Let that sink in for a second. Your car came down in the assembly line and there's somebody there and they're doing something. They're going, <laughs> and this guy over here is welding something and this guy over here is putting in this part. And you are absolutely trusting them that they did their job. Are you not? If you go scuba diving and you've never been before and somebody's going to train you how to do that, do you listen? Do you look and listen to what they have to say? Practice it so that when you go down in the ocean, you understand, you understand how important that is? You hope, okay, my daughter's getting ready to take her driver's test. Are you hoping that she reads the book and practices for a while? Look at Patsy's about to fall out of her seat. She's going, yes, please get her to practice, right? Don't bring her down here and let her run into one of us, right? You, you get my point. A girl in my youth group, she didn't practice a whole lot, and she drove her dad's Jeep right through the garage. It was a, it was a split-level house, so the garage was on the side. And she drove it in there and got confused about the, the brake and the gas, and she drove it right in the middle of her den. She went right through the laundry room, right through the bathroom, and right into the den with the Jeep, her dad's Jeep. And he went, I wouldn't have parked it there. But you know what I mean? Is that we have to practice. It's important that we practice and learn these things. And why is, why is Jesus saying, please catch this? Because there's so many people who would say men are better than women. So many people who say God created man and then the woman is just along for the ride kind of thing. This helpmate, whatever. But she's sitting at his feet. And, you know, there are those folks that would say this is a woman that was caught in adultery. This is a woman that led a, led a sinful life at one point, And Jesus still counted her worthy to have her sit there and listen to what he had to say. And he's training and discipling her so that she can go out and do the same. She can make an impact for Jesus in the world. That's where we stand today as we go, Chris, please tell me what it is that I should be about here in this world. And that is exactly what Jesus was doing. Is he's saying, find somebody as a role model, as a mentor for you, 
and then you being a role model and mentor for the next person down the road. That's where he's calling us, and it's, it's for us to learn what the Bible says for us and then be able to teach that and show that to somebody else so that it will fix those things because there's our life is like a tire. It's a cycle that just keeps going around, and we keep making the same dumb decisions sometimes. We keep making the same mistakes, and it brings us back, and every five years we're in the same hole that we were in five years ago, and we can't seem to figure out why. And the reason is is because Jesus is not at the heart of it. He's not at the foundation of it. We are at the foundation of it. Our lives are the centered around us. And so as long as my life is centered around me, I'm going to keep looking at the TV and Jill's telling me something important and I'm not hearing it. We have to get to the point where we will turn our eyes to Jesus, open our ears and be quick to listen to what he has to say. Practice those things and put them in our lives on a daily basis. Those action steps that he's calling us to. It's only in doing that that we can get to the spot. Brother Andrew, and I'll end with this. Brother Andrew was just a person just like us. Felt called to go over into communist countries and take Bibles. And in doing that, we go, oh, okay, that's a good thing. No, no, that was a risky thing. He risked his life to do that even from the first time on. And that the, the communist government of the Soviets took that very seriously. And in fact, um, you would get put in jail, you'd get beaten, you'd get put in a gulag where you make big rocks into little rocks. Um, you would get killed for doing those kind of things. And so he went in this Volkswagen, which I shared at the Bible study was given to him, filled, packed to the gills. He goes into Hungary with all of these Hungarian Bibles, and he gets to the border, and right as he pulls up, he's in line to go through it. He said, Lord, please make seeing eyes blind. So that I can get these Bibles to the people who need them in hunger. Don't let these guards confiscate them. Don't let them arrest me. Don't let them put me in jail. Any of that. He goes through. And they go through everything that he has. And they go. Go on through. They don't stop him. He decides. Man. That was great. Okay. So um, I'm going to go right down here. And I'm going to pull down by the lake over here. And I'm going to have my lunch. So he pulls his Volkswagen down by the lake. He gets out a little teeny. He has a little teeny oven kind of grill thing that runs on charcoal, and he's able to cook him a little something on this grill. And while he's doing that and getting his food ready, a boat comes flying, a military boat comes flying across the lake, comes over, comes right up onto the shore. The guys jump out of it with machine guns. They run right over and stick the machine guns in his face, and they start asking him questions about what he's doing and why he's there because they can recognize that he's a foreigner. And he said, I sat there, and they said, we want to go through your stuff. So they start going through the, the car again. And he's sitting there, and he goes, you know, I'm just this foreigner, and they could shoot me at any point, and nobody would even care, no one would even know. And he's praying the whole time, Lord, protect me. Make seeing eyes blind. Let me be able to get these Bibles to them. And he said, his food, he had his sandwich in front of him, ready to eat. And he said, I was trying to figure out what the next move should be. And he said, if I said grace, if I bowed my head and said grace over this food, because these guys were all standing around doing different things and look somewhere, you know, just standing there with the guns on it. He said, if I bow my head, they'll know I'm a Christian and then they'll arrest me and put me in jail. That's how seriously they took it. And he said, Lord, you gave me this food. And he bows his head and he says a prayer over the food. He said, he hears guns cock. Guns cock, you know, the, the machine guns cock. And he said, then he opens his eyes after the prayer, takes a bite of the sandwich, says the guy's faces are just like grinding their teeth. They're just like, and they're angry. He can see it in their face. And the one guy from the car yells over to the other guys, and they all run as fast as they can, get back in the boat, take off, without saying anything to him, just leaving. And he's sitting there, and he's going, Lord, thank you. And he drives after his lunch into town, and he goes from church to church, handing the Bibles to the people that need the Bibles. Fruit was produced. God's will was done because he was willing to, out of faith, in those moments, he was willing to step out for Christ and do what God asked him to do, no matter if it risked his life or, or him being in jail or having to, to work hard labor camps. Whatever it took, he was going to make sure to do that for Christ. And that's where we are today is that God says, hey, I need you here. 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 And it's up to us to say, I will go. We pray.
Dear Lord, I am so thankful to be the pastor of this church and to be able to get in this pulpit and to be able to share a message from your word. And Lord, I know that your Holy Spirit takes it and uses it, that it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't come back void. We lift the name of Jesus on high and you raise all men up. We were thankful for those things, Lord. And so today I ask that you would inspire and motivate us, that you would grow us in our faith, that we would know your word better. And I pray that we could use it, that it would be like a, a utility belt that we use that has all of the things, the fruit of the spirit, that has our spiritual gifts, that it has the power of God and our faith in Jesus and, and the armor of God and all those things that we need to go out in this world and to minister and make a difference. Help us, Lord, to be effective and fruitful for you. And I pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to stand and, and we're going to sing a, a hymn together. And Jesus, I'm going to ask you the same question that Jesus asked the man who was at uh, the pool in John chapter 5. Jill, you guys can come on back over here. You can come back over in John chapter 5, Jesus encounters the man um, who is, uh, needs healing at the pool. He's been there 38 years. And Jesus asks him this question. It's the same question I ask you today as we stand and sing this song. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Will you come as we stand and sing? Sure, you're not under it when you, you do your thing, you know, you go to the, he's handing me the tools and I'm 
I'm trying to get that thing undone. I mean, I'm like, oh my goodness, who put this on here? I can't, oh my goodness. And I've got the bucket and everything, and I'm scooting it out of the way. I'm trying my best to get that thing open, get it, get that nut to come off of there, that drain plug. I'm like, and it finally gives way. And where am I? Right under. Right under. And it goes all in my hair and in my eyes, and I was so frustrated and mad. And in that moment, you know what I said? Whenever my dad talks from this point on, I'm going to listen to what he's got to say. I'm going to obey. Let's get to that point where we're doing that for Jesus. Will you sing with me this number 34? Is that what we're singing? Yeah. We'll sing together a cappella, number 34. Jill, you go ahead and start it there. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God bless you all. Have a great week.